Good evening. Today is Monday Thursday, and maybe some of you are watching this and wondering, what is Monday Thursday? I had a staff member that told me uh, just today that he had had four or five conversations recently about people asking, what, what is Monday Thursday? In the life of our own tradition as Baptists, we don't oftentimes uh, talk about liturgical calendaring uh, names and nomenclature. And so Monday Thursday might be a little foreign. I had an experience just yesterday that reminded me that we don't often use these words. I was text messaging a Methodist pastor who's a friend of mine, and I was asking him about weather probabilities and what they were thinking about with their Monday Thursday service. And I looked down on my at my phone before I pressed send, and it had autocorrected Monday Thursday to laundry. Thursday. And so even my cell phone doesn't exactly know what Monday Thursday is. But it comes from the Latin word connected to John chapter 13, verse 34, that original Monday Thursday. Jesus is given a new commandment, Monday. It is Latin for commandments. There in John chapter 13, verse 34, where we read, A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another just as I've loved you you also are to love one another. I want us just briefly to think about the events of, of Monday Thursday. And I want you to see that for the original participants of that original Monday Thursday experience that day, it was a day and night of both spiritual milestones for the disciples and emotional and spiritual and even physical agony for Jesus, our Savior. Early that Thursday evening, Jesus had shared with the disciples the most marvelous Passover meal of all time. If you could think of it this way, the original Passover meal that Monday Thursday was a baton of some sorts that was being passed from the uh, Old Testament understanding of the Passover meal that it symbolized God setting the Israelites free from Egyptian captivity, from the bondage of Pharaoh, the angel of death swooping down and the blood on the, on the uh, doorstops covering over all of those who were within God's protection against the angel of death. And so the original disciples are partaking of that Passover meal on Monday, Thursday, understanding that they're looking back, but never again, never again after the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus would they ever take of the Passover meal in the same way because it's a baton. It's simultaneously not only reaching back, but it's reaching forward. And so Jesus would reinterpret once and forever that Passover meal, and it is going to be the great and once and for all Passover meal. And so the disciples, they, they wouldn't have known that in that original setting then, but forevermore after the cross and the resurrection, they would have understood that Jesus was the firstborn son that the angel of death in the form of a Roman cross would be coming to claim once and for all the firstborn son. But this firstborn son being all in all is not only the firstborn son, but rather Jesus is also the Passover lamb who will take away the sins of all of humanity. So here is Jesus. He is both eternally the obedient firstborn son, and he is also simultaneously the spotless Lamb of God, who would take upon himself the sins of all of humanity. And so it would be that his blood would cover all of those who would trust him by faith, and they would forever be shielded from the angel of death's eternal blow. So, of course, the disciples, they would only understand this after the fact. They would only be able to think back and say, oh, yes, he said, this is my body, this is my blood, then they would be able to understand these connections, but not that first Monday, Thursday evening. From that moment on, this new Passover meal would be eaten, and it's going to be eaten in remembrance of Jesus and how we are able to celebrate that he has delivered us out of death, and he has delivered us out of the slavery of sin, and he leads us into that promised eternal kingdom of his beloved son. So in many ways, we think about that Monday Thursday as a spiritual milestone for the disciples, but we also want to reflect upon the emotional agony, the physical agony, the spiritual agony of Jesus on that first Monday Thursday. We know that after the Passover meal, Scripture tells us that later that same night, among the olive trees, Jesus was praying, 
Well, Scripture is clear that many times Jesus goes into a desolate place to pray, but yet never do we have an encounter in Scripture where the desolation was, was like this, the emotional desolation, the physical desolation, even the spiritual des desolation. In what we know to be the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus looked deeply into the Father's cup that he was about to drink, and he began to, to realize the anguish that he would feel. And everything in his human flesh wanted to flee the impending physical torture of crucifixion. And so he groaned with dread at the far greater impending spiritual torture of being forsaken by his father. And so with this distress, this emotional, this physical weight, this spiritual weight, he cries out, Father, all things are possible for you. Remove this cup from me. And in one of the most famous passages in all of Scripture, we read that he says, Not my will, but thine will be done. Eight words. Eight unfathomable words. In that moment, God the Son perfectly is obedient to God the Father. And Scripture would tell us in the book of Hebrews in chapter 5 that Jesus learned obedience through what he suffered. Never has another human, never has another human felt such an intense desire to be spared from the will of God. And never has any human exercised such humble, obedient faith to the Father's will. His obedience, it yields in this moment to the spiritual and the physical and the uh, emotional agony. And it, it was so perceptible that the passage of Scripture in Luke's Gospel tells us that Jesus is sweating and his sweat is like drops of blood, foreshadowing the blood that is going to ooze from his very pores upon the cross. So on Monday, Thursday, we reflect that no one understands better than God how difficult it is and can be for a human to embrace the will of God. You think about that. No human has suffered more in embracing the will of God than the Son of God. When Jesus calls us to follow him, whatever the cost, he is not calling us to do something he is either unwilling to do or has never done himself. That's why we look to Jesus, as the writer of Hebrews would say, as the author and the perfecter of our faith. He is our great high priest who understands far better than we do what it's like to willingly and faithfully endure the sometimes excruciating, sometimes momentarily painful will of the Father for the sake of the eternal joy set before us. And now Jesus lives, and he lives to intercede for us so that we will make it through the pain to the eternal joy. Notice that when we reflect upon Monday, Thursday, we join God the Son in praying to God the Father, thy will be done. And if we find that in our body, in our soul, in our thoughts, in our emotions, that we wish God's will for us could be done in a different way from what God's will appears to be for us, we may wholeheartedly pray with Jesus, Father, all things are possible for you. Remove this cup from me. But only if we will also pray with Jesus these eight gloriously humble words, yet not my will, but thy will be done. I pray this Monday, Thursday, that you would join your Savior in praying those words no matter what you are facing, no matter the struggles that have come into your life, the difficulties that have come into your life, the joys that are in your life, that we would be followers of Christ who would join our Savior in those words this Monday, Thursday, not my will, but thy will be done.